Hare Krishna Maharaj, please accept my humble obeisances. All glories to you and all glories to Srila Prabhupada. Thank you, Maharaj. We are very, very fortunate to have you on the call. Please take over the call. We figure it out. <laughs> still, still wondering why it happens. <laughs> okay, okay no, let's no. see. I'm going to get back to this. Is my call. Oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay well, can you put the verse up for me? Hare Krishna. There you go. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Krishna Bhuvacha Naya Deho Deha Bhajam Niloke Kastan Karma Arute Vid Bhujanye the Pode of Yam Putraka Yena said, Bum Sugadias Man Brahma Sakyam Tanantam. Translation Lord Rishabdev told his sons, My dear boys, of all the living entities who have accepted material bodies in this world, one has been awarded this human form should not work hard day and night simply for sense gratification, which is available even for the dogs and hogs that eat stool. One should engage in penance and austerity to attain the divine position of devotional service. By such activities, one's heart is purified. And when one attains this position, he attains eternal blissful life, which is transcendental to material happiness and which continues forever. So this is the first verse in this chapter. Rishabh Dave is going to be speaking the whole chapter to his sons on the more elevated forms of spiritual knowledge related to the process of bhakti. Srila Prabhupada's purport. In this verse, Lord Rishabh Dave tells his sons about the importance of human life. The word deha bak refers to anyone who accepts a material body. But the living entity who is awarded a human form must act differently from animals. Animals like dogs and hogs enjoy sense gratification by eating stool. After undergoing severe hardships all day, human beings are trying to enjoy themselves at night by eating, drinking, having sex, and sleeping. At the same time, they have to defend themselves. However, this is not human civilization. Human life means voluntarily practicing suffering for the advancement of spiritual life. There is, of course, suffering in the lives of animals and plants, which are suffering due to their past misdeeds. However, human beings should voluntarily accept suffering in the form of austerities and penance, in order to attain the divine life. After attaining the divine life, one can enjoy happiness eternally. After all, every living entity is trying to enjoy happiness, but as long as one is encaged in the material body, he has to suffer different kinds of miseries. A higher sense is present in the human form. We should act according to superior advice in order to attain eternal happiness and go back to Godhead. It is significant in this verse that the government and the natural garden, the father, should educate. Can't see that one section. They can. Could should educate subordinates and raise them to Krishna consciousness. Devoid of Krishna consciousness, every living being suffers in this cycle of birth and death perpetually. To relieve them from this bondage, enable them to become blissful and happy, bhakti yoga should be taught. A foolish civilization neglects to teach people how to raise to the platform of bhakti yoga. Without Krishna consciousness, a person is no better than a hog or dog. 
The instructions of Rishab Dave are very essential at the present moment. People are being educated and trained to work very hard for sense gratification, and there is no sublime aim in life. <clears throat> a man travels to earn his livelihood, leaving home early in the morning, catching a local train, and being packed into a compartment. He has to stand for an hour or two in order to reach his place of business. Then again, he takes a bus to get to the office. At the office, he works hard from nine to five, then he takes two to three hours to return home. After eating, he has sex and goes to sleep. For all this hardship, his only happiness is a little sex. Yan maitu nagi grihameri sukam hitu chum. Rishab clearly states that human life is not meant for this type of existence, which is enjoyed even by dogs and hogs. Indeed, dogs and hogs don't have to work so hard for sex. A human being should try to live in a different way and should not try to imitate dogs and hogs. The alternative is mentioned, human life is meant for tapasya, austerities and penances. By tapasya, one can get out of material clunch cultures. When one is situated in Krishna consciousness, devotional service, his happiness is guaranteed eternally. By taking to bhakti yoga devotional service, one's existence is purified. The living entity is seeking happiness life after life, but he can make a solution to all his problems simply by practicing bhakti yoga. Then he immediately becomes eligible to return home back to Godhead, as confirmed in the Bhagavad Gita. Janma karma chime divyam evim yo veti tatvataha taktua deham kura janma naiti mameti sorjuno. You want to push that close to the eyes, too far away. Just push it. I, it's, I think it's well, no, I just put it there and leave it there. That's it. Again? No, just leave it. There's no offering to do. All you do is it's maha. Uh, I did not want to tell you that I cannot finish the thing. There's no offering. It's all maha. Uh, I mean, not offering, but offering can to eat. Leave it there. I just leave it there. I'll push it closer. Yeah. You can't reach it. Uh -huh. It's too far away. Uh, I think you didn't understand. Yeah, well, uh, I know. the thing is, all you have to do is take it and put it there, and that's it. Mm -hmm. Leave it there. And I'll, I'll get it after you take it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. One who knows the transcendental nature of my appearance and activities does not, upon leaving the body, take to his birth again in this material world, but attains my eternal bowl, Arjuna. Om again, Timirandasya. So yeah, this uh, particular chapter, Rishab is instructing his sons. He has a hundred sons, 50 of them took the Krishna conscious, 50 didn't. And out of the 50, nine of them are really exemplary in the Krishna conscious. And then one of them, Bart, who later will later become the, the king of the world, his name will be Bart Maharaj. <laughs> and then you'll hear about Bart Maharaj in the rest of the fifth canto. <clears throat> so Rishabdev is an incarnation of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. 
That's why he's referred to Lord Risham Dev. He's an, an energy of the Lord, or an incarnation of the Lord, to teach a particular type of yoga. And you'll get to understand that yoga in the uh, upcoming verses, classes like that. Um, these instructions are right to the point. You'll find that um, verse after verse, Rishabh Dev doesn't mince words. He gets right to the point. He tells it like it is, you know, that working hard is animal life. It's not human life. Uh, to work hard means to uselessly spend energy for nothing because it says that the human being is not meant to work hard. Human being is meant to natato, uh, brahma, jigyasa, to understand the purpose of human life, that is to inquire into the nature of the absolute truth and perform the activities in relationship to the Lord in devotional service. So here, he uses very strong language. Working hard is for animals, and he picks out some of the, the lower animals, dogs and hogs, that simply uh, eat all kinds of refuge like that. Now, this is not human life, and we see people go to work. I remember when I was traveling in India, I met one young man. I was traveling from from uh, uh, from Bombay to um, Pune. Now that's about a four and a half hour train ride. So I met this one young young man on the train, and he was telling me that he lives in Pune and works in Bombay. <laughs> So daily, he's taking a four and a half hour train ride. He works in the stock exchange as a cleaner. He cleans the stock exchange, doing janitorial work in the stock exchange. He can't find any work where he in his in Pune, so he, he's accepted work all the way in Bombay. He try he spends nine hours practically every day on the train. And then he hardly even sees his family members. I think he only had a wife. He didn't have any children at the time. And uh, I was kind of shocked. I never met such a severe situation where a person has to travel nine hours every day back and forth to work. I felt I should offer some advice to him that... Uh, you know, you might want to look for a different job or do something because how long can you last doing this? It'll just take all your energy after a while. And just being on the train, and, you know, he was listening. He was a very nice person, but I don't know if he actually took me serious or not. Well, you should see, these are, this is one of many examples. People in big cities, sometimes they sit two to three hours in their car traveling to work, getting stuck in what they call rush hour traffic. <laughs> and uh, they can't move sometimes for, you know, almost an hour. Sometimes there's the backup of the traffic is so bad they can't even go anyplace. So this is not human life. This is animal life, simply to work hard for food or some kind of dwelling to live in. But why do people work hard to maintain a family so they can enjoy sense gratification in the form of sex life? And this is what is being illustrated here. This Prabhupada makes this point over and over again in this verse. So that's why people are not happy. 
That's why there's so many problems. That's why people don't know where they're going in life. That's why people are always so, so fearful of everything because they don't understand what is, what is human life and how to use it. To receive a human birth is a very uh, rare opportunity. Uh, we may not think like that, but to get a human birth is very, very rare. Most living entities who come to the material world are in other species of life, such as insects, trees, plants, beasts. The human form is the smallest number in comparison to the other four categories of living entities, birds also. So to get a human form of life means that one has to traverse the uh, system of gradually going from one form of body to another. The soul transmigrates from one form to another. Finally, when it gets to human life, it has a chance to stop the whole process of birth and death, which is the process that keeps one struggling hard unnecessarily simply to maintain oneself. And the only happiness is a little sex life and some, maybe some food, that's about it. <laughs> People, people's happiness is so meager compared to the struggles they put up in order to get it. And that is, that is modern civilization. Working, sometimes they don't work Physically, they work on the computer for hours and hours and hours, which causes them to have eyesight problems, dry eyes, headaches, and other things that will develop in due course of time if there's prolonged use of computers. So, and this is what we have today is going on as advancement of human life. But if an advancement of human life starts, not just is, but starts when people start asking questions into the nature of the Supreme Lord and what is my relationship with the Supreme Lord. Therefore, in order to attain that divine position of devotional service, one has to practice penance and in austerities. So in our Krishna consciousness society, devotees have accepted voluntarily to accept some austerities. So for instance, no illicit sex, that means no sex out of marriage and only for the procreation of children, no uh, intoxication, including coffee, tea, and any forms of intoxicants, uh, no uh, gambling, or then that means all no, no frivolous activities also, which are categorized in the in the area of gambling. Frivolous sports, as Prabhupada mentions, and uh, no eating of meat, fish, eggs, like that. No chewing tobacco, pawn, <laughs> all that, all all that stuff. So this is, uh, these are the austerities that are recommended and then chanting 16 rounds every day on beads without fail. As Prabhupada said, this is my, his most important instruction to his disciples. And accepting the austerity of getting up early in the morning and uh, engaging in devotional activities throughout the day. And this, this austerity actually becomes a source of happiness as one develops the mood of accepting the austerity and starts to feel the pleasure that comes by way of an, uh, offering one's energy, time, uh, intelligence in the service of the Lord. Then it becomes nectar. The austerity is no longer there anymore. It becomes nice. But in order to get a foothold in devotional service, 
one has to accept these austerities that are given to us by the scriptures, which are coming from the Supreme Lord himself. And as we practice Krishna consciousness, it becomes natural, it becomes easy, it becomes, uh, what we say, enjoyable. Susukam kartam avyayam. So sometimes materialistic people will find fault or attempt to find fault with the devotees saying, well, you people, you don't have any fun in your life. What do you do? <laughs> you know, you don't go to movies, you don't go to nightclubs, you don't go to discotheques. And we say, well, you know, we sing, we dance, we eat nice food that is healthy, it's not full of chemicals or poisons and it ele elevates your consciousness. We eat nice food, we sing, we dance, we discuss philosophy and we do things to, to serve the Lord. And we feel we're, we're happy in all these, these activities. This is real happiness. And so they can't understand that because they're in a whole different mind, mindset. They simply see that as a waste of time you should be working hard, you should have a big house, you should have a big family, you should, uh, you know, have a position in society, you should uh, have a nice car, you should have the latest of everything that's available on the market. And uh, I remember there was one, <laughs> one, uh, uh, man he had he owned this house and a uh, nice house it was in it was in the more of a rural area there was a, a lake nearby the house and he had set up a tennis court it was a nice it was right near our temple so one devotee family they moved into the house and he was paying them to keep the house and the land uh, together, because he had horses and other things. He had so many things, horses and other animals and keeping the grounds. So he was paying the man of the family money and the man was living in the house for free and he was getting paid to take care of the property. So this man has this house, <laughs> he never uses it. <laughs> he simply pays somebody else to maintain it. And he lives in a city in an, in, in a, an apartment building because he, he works in an office in the city. So I was thinking, boy, the devotees are really intelligent. They get a free house, plus they get paid. They get a nice area to live in, which is healthy. And uh, the man who owns the house, he doesn't even have an opportunity. He comes and checks it out once in a while and makes sure everything's going on in the work area. But that's it. What's the use of having a house if you pay somebody else to maintain it and then they use it and enjoy the act activities. So if people are like that, they just have so many things they can't maintain it. They pay other people to maintain it. They have something, you know. Prabhupada also says, yeah, man has a nice big house. He leaves the house early in the morning. He works the whole day. He comes at night, takes something to eat, and then he falls asleep in the house. And the next morning he gets up and does the same thing. So he, uh, he only sees the house maybe one or two days a week. <laughs> the rest of the week, He's just sleeping there and eating a little bit and going out. It's more like a hotel. And somebody has this big house, which he's paid so much money for. And he's probably still paying, taking out mortgages. So people don't have any intelligence nowadays. The animals have more intelligence than the average person. Because the, and the animals don't have to work hard for the basic things of the body such as eating, sleeping, working, and recreation. The animal can go anywhere and slay, lay down and sleep nicely. We have to have a big gigantic bed, which takes up most of the room. 
And it's, you have to have all kinds of stuff to decorate the bed and make it look nice. <laughs> and so people are working so hard just for the animal propensities of eating, sleeping, mating, and defending. And they waste their whole human life. And then after some time, they get old and they get fearful. Death is coming. They're sick. They can't do anything. They hire people to take care of them if they have money. If they don't, they put their old, the old people in the old age home and then they sit there and they die like a vegetable. So just because they don't want to take the Krishna consciousness or spiritual life, they'll accept all kinds of suffering simply because of that. The devotee accepts a little bit of difficulty simply to uh, move, get a foothold in devotional service, some little austerities, some restrictions. And then after a while, the devotee enjoys these restrictions as, as much as they enjoy anything. So this is Krishna consciousness. So human life, this verse is very strong. Srila Prabhupada gave at least eight classes on this verse alone. He spoke so much on this verse. This is one of his favorite verses from the Srimad Bhagavatam. So you can, if you want to take further information about this verse, just look up Srila Prabhupada's classes. He spoke so many times on this verse. Nayan deho deho bhajan merloke kastan karma arati vid bhujan jaypato divyam putakodhyane sarvam the last line is really powerful. Go to the translation. It says here, by such activities, one's heart is pure and one attains this, but he attains eternal blissful life, which is transcendental to material happiness and which continues forever. Material happiness is not something that is actually described as happiness from the spiritual point of view. It just looks like happiness because it's a little better than the suffering that people undergo. And material happiness is flickering, just like when you light a match, you should know that the match will go out very quickly. So in the same way, material happiness is uh, uh, just an, it's just an we use the word uh, oxymoron. An oxymoron is a terminology that means two things that don't go together, material happiness like that. So when people think if they can enjoy their senses, they're happy, the sense gratification is there for the animals. So the animals do it better. The pigeon can have sex at six, 60 times in an hour. A hog, um, a, a bear can sleep at six months at a time. Uh, a uh, elephant can eat 40 kgs of food per day. Uh, so eating, sleeping, sex, and uh, the skunk, he stinks so bad he lets out his odor, he can defend himself really easy just by uh, exuding his bodily uh, smell and no one comes around. <laughs> Not even the other animals. So these propensities that the, the human beings work so hard to do, they're done really better with for the animals. So the animals are actually more intelligent in these categories. So this is a sad situation when the human life, it's like somebody gives you a million dollars and you take it and you just throw it into the fire and you burn it. That's what how the human form of life is so valuable, and it's, but it's being wasted simply because people uh, don't have any intelligence to understand something better or they're just addicted to suffering. Some people, one person was asking me a question one time that uh, he says, you know, the only way you can appreciate happiness is that when you suffer. 
And this was, a, I was giving a class, it was in India, it was in a place called Nigri. Nigri is near, near Pune. Maybe you know the place Nigri, for those of you who are from India. It's in Maharashtra. And uh, this boy said, yes, Maharaj, but the only way we can really appreciate happiness is that we have to suffer. <laughs> And and I and I just uh, I remembered there is a particular caricature. There's one person called the moron. There's a, in in America they have this guy who is completely an idiot. He's the idiot personified. They call him a moron. And what the moron does is he bangs his head against a, a cement wall, and then when he he says, oh, it feels, now this is material life. They get a little relief from the suffering and they consider that to be happiness. But real happiness is attaining the divine position of Krishna consciousness, which is the, the eternal principle of the soul's existence. Susukam kartavabhyam, the soul is eternal, full of knowledge and always blissful. So what Prashab Dev is saying here is don't waste the human form of life and become like animals. Use it to perform a little austerity and that will bring you to transcendental happiness and to the position of eternal blissful life. Okay, so um, you're about to enter into a very, very interesting and very powerful chapter. This chapter is one of the, they call this, this particular chapter, they call this um, the chapter for the Paramahansas. <laughs> this chapter is one of the most deepest and most complete understanding of the process of Bhakti Yoga, like that. Rishabh Dave doesn't, he gets right to the point in instructing his sons. So I think you'll find it very interesting. Try to, and Prabhupada gave classes on a lot of the verses in this chapter. So you may also want to correlate your class studies with Prabhupada's lectures to get further knowledge of what this chapter is about. Okay, so I'll stop there and see if there's any comments or questions. Hare Krishna Maharaj, please accept my humble obeisances. Very, very beautiful, beautiful class, Maharaj. Very nice instructions. And uh, you were talking how devotees are very, very intelligent. Uh, they they try to, you, you know, you were talking about how that person was enjoying the house at the same time, getting money. Um, we, we should not work hard like uh, animals. We should try to utilize our time most in Krishna consciousness. Very, very nice, uh, Maharaj. And you are talking, we can only appreciate happiness when we are in sad. So true, Maharaj. Sometimes we feel, oh, we don't have this, we don't have that. There, there, will, there might be some situation where what we have today might be missing sometime. Maybe we, we are in traveling. We did not have that kind of um, uh, comfortability in travel. Then that time you feel like appreciating the things that you had at home, uh, which you were, you know. Uh, so when we have uh, that kind of uncomfortability, then only we we'll know what exactly we have, what people are not even having that things. Um, so nice explanation, Maharaj. And you were telling this chapter is uh, that really taste of devotional service because Rishabh Devi is explaining to his children. Uh, you are coming and starting this chapter. I'm feeling so fortunate, Maharaj, from hearing from you, the first loka. Thank you so much, Maharaj. Hare Krishna, dear devotees. Anybody having any questions or realizations, please go ahead. Hare Krishna. Dear Guru Maharaj, please accept my humble obeisances. All glories to Srila Prabhupada. All glories to your holiness. This is such a wonderful uh, beginning to our day hearing from you and such a reminder about the valuable 
human life that we have been given and how this is really an opportunity to go back to Krishna, get out of the cycle of birth and death. Uh, my question is about devotees who come to Krishna consciousness. They understand some of the philosophy, but they are not able to really take to the process in all seriousness. They start making excuses. They say, oh, I cannot chant my rounds. I'm feeling very discouraged. I have so much work to do. I have this problem. I'm a single mother. I don't have a, or I don't, uh, I'm not properly situated in, in my ashram. I really need a wife. Then only I can start chanting or I really need a husband or I really need a house. And then they run after all these things. Uh, trying to situate themselves nicely in material life, then they are going to take up devotional life. So I'm just a little concerned about how many devotees I see around me who are not really diving deep, but simply either skimming the surface or making excuses. Uh, how we can help them? <laughs> well. Well, the best way is by your own example. You have to get to know the individual. And if they're open for help, that's one thing. If they're not open for help, there's nothing you can do, no matter what you say or how you say whatever, what, whatever you're going to say is not going to change. You have to see if they're a little bit wanting to understand something different than what they're doing. If they're not, then what can you do? Just like a lot of times I get letters from devotees and others, they tell me what they're going to do and they want my blessings. <laughs> so, <laughs> they have their ideas and they submit it and they say, Maharaj, please give your blessings. Well, <laughs> so how can I give blessings or attempt to give blessings to people who already set on what they're going to do? No matter what I, whatever I say or don't say is not going to change them. So, uh, yeah, this is Kali Yuga. So obviously, they're not so serious about spiritual life. They took it up for a particular reason. And then after some time, things changed. Prabhupada used to say, don't be surprised who leaves be surprised who stays. Yeah. So, yes, uh, if someone's sincere, then they'll ask for help. Or they'll seek out help in some way. If you're not sincere, or if you want excuses, because Krishna consciousness is not dependent on any material situation. All you need is Krishna consciousness. All you need is three things in Krishna consciousness. To chant Hare Krishna, to take Krishna prasadam, and to associate with devotees. Although that's the only needs you have. Everything else is extra. Now, if you're a mother with a family and so many other things, you should think, well, uh, how can I become Krishna conscious in this situation? Well, how can I utilize my time? So, they don't want to take time to learn how to utilize their time. You asked me this question about a week ago, the same question, and I explained to you that I knew one mother 
who just got a new child. And she was spending all her time with the child, which was what was she was supposed to do. The child required every minute of the mother's attention and care. So uh, she wrote me saying, that I, you know, I can't find time to chant my 16 rounds. What do I do? So I gave her a formula. She liked the formula. It's a formula that Prabhupada gave us for those who live in that situation. She tried the formula, it worked. And then now she's chanting 16 rounds and still taking care of her child. So if you're sincere, you, you'll look for some solution. If you're not sincere, then you'll just complain and shut down and say, this is the way it is. So my question is, how should I understand that I should not intervene or not try to help because they're very good at drawing you in, getting your sympathy, making a big song and dance about how pitiable they are. And then I spend my time and energy trying to help. And then I find out they're not, trying, they're not interested in any solution. They just want to take up more of my energy and time complaining. So you can say, before you start the conversation, do you want my opinion? Do you want my advice? Or do you want me to tell you what to do? Ask them those three questions. Do you want me to tell you what to do? Do you want me to tell you, do you want my advice? Or do you want my opinion? My opinion is my opinion. My advice is something that I'm going to offer to help you. And if you want me to tell you what to do, then you should be ready to accept it. So you can ask that question. Oh, that's very helpful. You're speaking. Do you, want, do, you, do, you, do you want my advice or you just want to, you want some shoulder to cry on? That's all. Oh, that is very, very helpful. Thank you very much, Guru Maharaj. I really appreciate this advice. I'm grateful to you. Thank you. Well, someone's asking, what is the formula for the 16 rounds? Yes. Well, this is generally for mothers who are with children or people who are just so busy in life that they can't find time. When you get up, you chant four rounds. Then after breakfast, I mean, bef uh, when you get up, you chant four rounds. When before lunch, you chant four more rounds. Before evening meal, you chant four more rounds. And before taking rest, you chant four more rounds. Four times four. <laughs> Which usually is about a half hour, four times a day. Okay. Four when you get up four before lunch, four before evening meal, and four before rest. Or if you want to make your own schedule of four, 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 and four, you can do that. But this is the recommended, recommended formula. Thank you, Maharaj. Thank you so much. Maharaj, there is one question in the chat, Maharaj. I'm going to read that. Um, in today's world, should women work? Many women prefer to work for their development, developmental purpose. Is it a right, right approach? Is it, who, is it a Western lady or an Indian lady asking me this? Uh, I guess Indian only. Name looks so. Namrata Mataji. Well, this is... <laughs> Well, you know, this, this, this answer to this question could, you know, go into tomorrow's class, you know. You really want me to tackle this one, huh? I can give you one word answer. <laughs> I can tell you that 
the difficulties of working in the workplace, it depends on your material situation. But generally, if the husband is working, he needs a wife, not a co-worker. A woman is supposed to make, take care of the needs of her husband and make the home, take care of the children, make the home, take care of the needs. If you have a uh, an altar, take care of the house, like that. When the husband comes home, the mother, the woman is refreshed, she's rested, she can cook. Not that she comes home and he comes home and uh, they, well, what's for eat? I don't know, go look in a refrigerator, you know. <laughs> it's like... <laughs> Uh, men think oh, I married a, my, a co-worker and I didn't get a wife, you know. <laughs> oh, my God. And the other thing is that women in the workplace are, tend to be exploited by the, by the association they're in. Uh, they're given lesser pay generally and at the same time the uh, you know, if the lady has some attractiveness to her, you know, the guys are looking at her and that, that pollutes the whole environment. So it's not very chaste for a lady to go into a workplace with other men around who she's married. But nowadays people don't care. They want the money. Well, they want their, what they call so-called freedom, but that's not really freedom. I think it's another form of bondage, that's all. When a woman plays, if the, if the woman plays her role and the man plays his role, then the home is nice. But if the woman wants to play the role of the man and the man plays the role of the woman or half man, half woman, then things get topsy-turvy. I saw, I mean, I've seen some, some marriages fall apart because of that. I had to save one marriage because it was on a, it was on a crisis stage because of that. It was an actual crisis. Finally, they, they listened to what I said. And, and somehow or other, they were able to repair the marriageable damage. But, so, you know, it's, I don't, I don't think it's, you know, everybody thinks, well, we need a house. We need a lot of money at the beginning. We have to, I'm only going to work for two years until the children come. And then I won't work anymore. So uh, in principle, I'm against it. I don't think it's good. It's not Vedic culture. It's simply modern day ex exploitative culture. Women are exploited. The, out of all the people in the, in the world, the women in society are the most exploited. For various reasons. The woman is glorious. They actually did a, uh, in America, they did this survey. If you had to pay a, a person to do all the duties that a household wife does throughout the day, how much money would she make at the end of the year? And it came to, this was about 10 years ago, they did this survey. It was like $45,000 for one year for a housewife. So that's how much she was worth 10 years ago, that was, of course. You know, the value of money has changed since then. So yeah, it's, it's a noble profession to be a housewife. <laughs> it's glorious. And sometimes they neglect the children because, or they push the children off onto the relatives or sometimes even in daycare centers and the children grow up not having a, you know, parental care, parental guidance, parental, parental leadership. So there, these are some of the things that I see and have experienced with people over the years.
So. Uh, Guru Maharaj, I've seen that even when women do not want to work and they do want to follow the Vedic principles, their husbands are pushing them to go work, make more money, bring more money home. That doesn't make it right. I'm not saying that the husbands are any better. <laughs> I'm just saying this is the situation. Thank you, Maharaj. There is another question in the chat. Um, am, am I, am I going to get, uh, you know, some feedback from this? Okay, okay. Anybody got to throw rocks at, at, at the screen? <laughs> <laughs> no, Maharaj, your answers are always perfect and we, we love it, Maharaj. And Mataji, you, you want to say thank you, Narma, Narmata Mataji? Uh, yeah. No, she won't uh, say thank you. <laughs> no, Maharaj, she was talking. She, had, she got unmuted. That's why I was asking. Uh, yeah, just, just a little follow-up, Maharaj. Um, Many, even in families, uh, uh, parents or the relatives, they ask women that, oh, you are, you are educated, you're quite highly educated, you should work and all that. If you have time for your developmental purpose, is, is that a right approach or they should not do that? They can, people can give advice, but they can't, they can't demand that you follow it. But now, due to this particular situation, women can work from home. So working from home is okay. I'm just against women going into the workplace, into the offices, like them being exploited in that way. But the ideal situation is a woman should always be a, a preferred to be a housewife. Am I right, Maharaj? You can have a profession too. It's not it doesn't mean that she can't have professions, but I don't think she should be she be should be using her professions in the workplace. Now that that really I mean I mean the big you know you see women everywhere in the workplace now. There's more and more women taking positions everywhere. It's like becoming a fashion now. So what I'm saying is, is according to the Vedic scheme, which is, you know, the husband has to play his role and the wife has to play their role, her role in order for the family to get everything that is needed. Yeah. If the woman plays the role of the husband, then there's something lacking on that side. But she can have her profession. She can work from home. As long as she doesn't spend the whole day working, she also has to take care of the house. and um, She could work part-time from home. Okay. That's all right. That's a compromise, but still, I can, I can see that that's, that's permissible. Mm -hmm. uh, Guru Maharaj, what about cases where the husband is not there? Um, the mother has a child now, husband has taken off, or he won't go to work, or he has addictions, he has so many challenges, and he says, I cannot work, you have to work and earn. Women cannot take as much stress as men can. And that's one of the reasons why they have a lot of emotional and psychological problems. Men can take more stress than women generally. Generally, that's just a general, the general nature of the, of the psyche. Usually, that's just the difference between men and women. And men can take much more stress than women can. And to live, to work in the, in the world is stressful. It is definitely stressful.
Thank you, Mother. There are so many abandoned wives and mothers who have no one to take care of them, who have no one to earn for them. What should they do in this situation? I don't know. You should, uh, you mean devotees or people in general? Uh, devotees. Well, they should connect with other devotees. Or they can, they can, devotees are usually friendly because sometimes you can, I'm just giving practical examples. I'm not saying that this is a solution. The idea is if you're alone, try to change that and get association living together with other devotees, living in the temple, living in a holy place. These are all possible solutions. It's a very complex situation. It's become more complex with, with modern society. I can't really say that there is a, a particular solution, but I think the Vedic scheme is the, is the prototype that we can work with. What is the, the role of a woman in relationship to the family? What is the role of the man in relationship to the family? Thank you so much. Uh, we have to raise hands, Maharaj. Um, Vamshidhar Prabhu, please go ahead. Hare Krishna Maharaj, Dhanvat Pranam. So, Maharaj, like I have a question. So we say that, that uh, in conditioned state, we cannot perform pure devotional service. So sometimes I get doubt uh, like I understand that I cannot, I'm not at a stage to anywhere near the stage to perform pure devotional service. But I sometimes get doubt that am I even performing devotional service? Uh, not just pure, like even just I'm performing devotional service or not. So how to overcome that uh, doubt, Maharaj? And uh, how to see that uh, uh, my service is pleasing, like uh, Hari Toshnam, we say that some Siddhi Hari Toshnam. So how, how I can practically... Uh, get some indication or some realization that yes, whatever, whatever I'm doing is really pleasing Krishna and it's not like I'm doing Shamaya Vikavala. Um, well, work underneath the guidance of a spiritual teacher. Get advice on, on the activities you're asked to perform or the activities you want to perform. And this this is the reason why we have a spiritual master is to get to clarify any doubts that we have in terms of the execution of our services. But devotional service, I'll give you a general principle is that if we're trying to please Krishna, then that's devotional service. If we're not trying to please Krishna, but performing the activities that make up devotional service, there is some benefit because it's devotional service. But it's not, it's not the complete benefit or not even half the benefit. In other words, if I perform devotional service because I want to be happy, well, that's nice, but that's really, it's all about us. Mm -hmm. If I'm performing devotional service, because if I don't, I'm afraid I'll have to suffer because I'm not. That's, that's the lowest form of motivation. If I'm performing devotional service because it's my duty and I've been given this duty and I'm doing it the best I can, that's acceptable. Because whether I feel happy or not, it doesn't matter, it's my duty. Whether it's easy or difficult, it doesn't matter, it's my duty. Then you're nicely situated in devotional service. And higher than that, 
is that if you're attracted to Krishna in love and devotion, and you're serving him in that mood, that is the highest. So that's how that mood comes and goes sometimes. We, we find some attraction, but it doesn't stay steady. So if we can stay steady on the platform of duty, then we're, we're nicely situated. It's my duty to follow the guidelines that I've been given by my spiritual master. And if you're not sure all of them, then just ask questions. Thank you, Mara. It's really helpful. Like you hit the point that if you remain duty bound, even if it is duty bound and if you remain steady there, uh, so that is that is the essence. Like uh, no matter what the external situation is, just remain steady in our whatever duties we have taken up uh, to yeah. do our devotional service. Right. That's, a, that's a very stable platform. Right, right, right. Yes. Thank, Thank you, you Mara. Maharaj, like uh, uh, I have a follow up for the previous discussion. So in today's time, like uh, for daughters uh, in the family, uh, so we like I don't know, like my personal preference is not like that. Like I personally totally in align with uh, what uh, Bhagavatam tells us. But in today's time, like daughters are equally try to equally educated as uh, the sons and uh, having a competitive college degrees and this and that. So that obviously then set them up for that kind of thing that once they get uh, educated, then they need to go out and use that particular education, what they did rather than, you know, spending more time in doing household activities, learning household responsibilities and things like that, but rather they are spending more of their youth in going to college and studying. So, so how how do tackle that because it's very difficult to you know uh, especially if you're not a devotee from like i i came to krishna consciousness when my daughter was like 12 years old so now it's very difficult to change their mindset you know to not go to that like routine path and uh, going, uh, rather well, that, think about that path. that's that's the western influence it's happening uh, in india also right India is doing the same thing, educating. Uh, but mm, they should also become first-class housewives also. And that requires some training from the, generally from the mother-in-law. Well, but it says the mother-in-law usually tra ch uh, trains up the daughter-in-law how to serve her son. <laughs> Those are son the best. <laughs> so, so they take guidance on once they get married, and then they can take guidance from their from their mother in law, right. like that. So, uh, so but they, if they have a profession, what can you do? That's the way the society is geared now. They all want to be professionals in mm -hmm. some areas. Mm -hmm. But the thing is, if they're going to get married and their profession becomes the foremost thing and their marriage second, then they're going to run into problems. Right. 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 So I think the most practical approach would be to, like, if, if they have education, they can work for a few years until they get married and then try to find a match or family where they get nicely situated after marriage so that they get all the support uh, to uh, continue the path of Krishna consciousness rather than getting into that material rate race. Yeah, that's the best compromise scenario you can get. <laughs> Thank you, Maharaj. Very, very practical and very <laughs> thankful. Thankful to you for this. Hare Thank Krishna. You. I get hit with this stuff for the last 40 years I've been dealing with this. <laughs> so. Right. <laughs> and we want to help the we want to help the householders as much as we can because they seem to be the ones that are struggling with the dichotomy between spiritual life and material responsibilities. Right. Thank you, Matt. Thank you. Shamagori. Shamagori, what work do you do? 
हरे कृष्ण महाराज प्लीज एक्सेप्ट मैं बोलो प्रभुपात I I also wanted to ask question like uh, you said uh, human beings they should not work hard but what if uh, devotees they work hard and uh, make the facilities for Krishna pre Krishna consciousness to spread Krishna consciousness and having programs and uh, so for that we need money right. And for money, we need uh, to work hard. <laughs> if you're working for Krishna, that's not the that's not working hard. That's devotional service. Prabhu said, "Work hard for Krishna," but it's not work. It's it's actually enjoyment. It's bhakti. Yeah, one. I could read it to you here. The sound. Let me just look at it here. I'll find it here. Yeah. This is a problem. I said, so far as your working engagement is concerned, certainly you are not a karmi. Any person who cons whose constant occupation is Krishna consciousness is not a karmi. He's a devotee in all circumstances. You should accept the best source of monetary income and use it for Krishna. That is better than sanya. Stick to your job and use it for Krishna consciousness. You are not a karmi. That was Prabhupada's letter to Gopal Krishna Maharaj when he was Gopal Krishna Brahmachari, a Grihastha. Grihastha. Thank you, Maharaj, for giving uh, your valuable time and association every Friday. Fridays are very blissful for us. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, other question? Hi, Krishna Maharaj. Please accept my humble obeisances. All glories to Srila Prabhupada. Yes, like Shama Gauri said, Fridays are so very special just to have your association every Friday morning. It's, it's just so wonderful. And thank you so much for this beautiful class. And I appreciate all of your comments. <laughs> so thank you for them. Um, the question that I had is... Um, kind of the opposite of what Sri Devi started out asking about, you know, all of these verses, these are some of my favorite verses because they're very direct, which is the way um, that I like to get things. And um, I feel like they're so important for non-devotees to hear. Um, you know, these are, these are the biggest problems of the world is that people are working so hard for material gain and Krishna consciousness and, and devotee life is so pleasurable and so joyful. And so my question is more, how do we, you know, what's, like I said, I tend, I tend to, I like to receive directly, but I also like to give directly. And I want to be able to preach to non-devotees in a way that brings them to Krishna consciousness, but gives them these messages are so important for, for all of us to have, for, for us to hear. So I would appreciate anything that you have to say about that, Maharaj. Hare Krishna. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Well, that's a depends on the person who you're talking to. 
Well, if somebody who is who has your confidence, who you can talk to, I just encourage them to chant. You can encase this chanting as a nice way to feel happy. You can, if you chant, you'll feel happy. If you chant, you get rid of stress. Um, it's easy, no rules, no regulations. You can do it anytime. You can do it on the on the beads if you like, or you can do it off beads if you want. To get someone to chant is a great achievement. Because once people start chanting, then they're on their way back to Godhead. It's just a matter of time. So that's that's our concern is to try to spread the glories of the holy name and uh, attract people to the chanting. Uh, one of the ways you can do is you like to cook and you make some nice things and offer to your deities or to a picture or either one and, and give these uh, foodstuffs to others. That's, that's actually an act of devotion to offer Krishna Prashadam to another person. It's a very intimate form of connection. Mm -hmm. People like, you know, you can cook some novelty things that people are not familiar with so to, to spark their interest. Well, it's, that's one of the best ways to foreshadow. Hare Krishna. Thank you so much for that sweet answer, Maharaj. Thank you. I will definitely take that to heart. Yeah, it, it works. It works. Prashadam works. Mm -hmm. Holy name and Prashadam. Mm -hmm. Or if you carry some small books with you as you go around, you can some see if there's somebody's interested in reading or have a little philosophical inclination. You can uh, say, here's a nice book. Just take some time, sit back. You got more time now. You're not traveling so much. You read the read the book. <laughs> if they read the book, they're on their way. <laughs> Krishna consciousness is very powerful. Anybody who steps into it, even if they don't continue, they will continue at one point in their life. Thank you so much, Maharaj. I'm very grateful for your answer. Hare Krishna. Jai Ho, thank you. Hare Bol. Hare Krishna. Thank you, Maharaj. Thank you so much. Uh, is there anybody having any more questions for Maharaj? Hare Krishna, Mataji. If Maharaj yes. has one question. Maharaj, do you have more time, Maharaj? I'm running short on time right now, but I can take one more question for sure. Okay, okay. But Mr. Ki Mataji, go ahead, Mataji, for that question. Hare Krishna Maharaj, please accept my humble obeisances. Maharaj, you were mentioning that um, um, when you were giving a lecture near Pune, uh, the, a person came and said that if we have to appreciate suffering, we have to, no, no, when, when, when we see the suffering, we appreciate happiness. So um, Maharaj, when we are suffering, it is very, very easy to appreciate happiness and it's very easy to appreciate the blessings that we get. But there is a high chance that after we come out of that suffering, we tend to uh, forget the blessings or the suffering that we have gone through. So um, how can we always remember what we have gone through or what we have received in our life? Can you please? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's the tendency of the conditioned soul is to forget after the, after the suffering is gone, we forget, we do the same thing again. Habit is second nature. Try to remember and pray to Krishna to, to help you avoid falling into that same pattern again. 
I think praying to Krishna will make a big difference because he'll help us to remember, oh, you're going to do this again. This has caused you some suffering. So remember. So praying to Krishna will, will help you, are saying, right, Maharaj? Will help you remember what you went through before so you don't do it again. <laughs> yes, Maharaj. We'll do that. Thank you. And, Thank you. And, and Maharaj, I just wanted to say that in 2013, when you were in, you came to Cincinnati, don't know if you remember or not. Uh, 2013, you have been to uh, Cincinnati and uh, you you just came with the, on Prabhuji, I forgot. So we were there that time at Cincinnati and then everybody was asking like, Maharaj eats only whole wheat bread. Is there anybody who can make the whole wheat bread? So, so I was very new into Krishna consciousness that time and then I volunteered. I made that bread and you were leaving after that the next day morning. So I was thinking, did Maharaj like the bread? Did Maharaj like the bread? Nobody said anything. You were about to leave. You were near the door. You turn back and you ask, who made the bread? <laughs> then, then I came forward. Then you really um, appreciated. Maybe by your blessings, I uh, picked up Krishna consciousness much better than before. And that time I was not initiated. So my name was Prashanti. So you were giving the uh, explanation of my name to <laughs> meaning. So that's a sweet memory that I had in Cincinnati when you... I, I almost re I remember speaking about your name. That I can remember. <laughs> yes, Maharaj. Thank you so much. And thanks for the bread again. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> Thank you so much, Maharaj. <laughs> you. Thank you, Maharaj. Thank, Thank you Krishna. so keep much. Making, keep making bread for the devotees. <laughs> By your blessing, Maharaj. <laughs> Thank you. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Okay, uh, Vinita, I think I have to close because I have another class coming up. Thank you, Maharaj. Thank you so much for your valuable time and association. Very beautiful question answer session, Maharaj. Thank you. Um, I would like to offer my obeisances. Vancha Kalpa Tarobya Siyatripa Sindhubya Evacha Patita Nam Pavanibyo Vaishnavibyo Namo Nama Ananta Koti Vaishnavrindiki Jai Shila Prabhupada Ki Jai His Holiness Chandra Moli Swami Maharaj Ki Jai Hare Krishna Maharaj Tanvat Pranam.